Hello, my name is Elsie Charity and my pronouns are she and they. I'm the Director of Programs and Culture at the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Science Unscripted with Fanta Traore. Our mission is to build inclusive and equitable STEM communities that genuinely represent our society. In doing so, it is imperative that we create and share space with historically marginalized communities and elevate our STEM leaders. There isn't one perfect path to success, especially in fields that were not built for us. We hope that through the conversations and connections we create in these digital rooms, we're able to show that there are role models and mentors we can look to for inspiration. I would like to thank Ms. Traore not only for her unshakable commitment to empowering Black women in economics, but also for being here to share her experiences and advice with us. She has kicked open doors and her work as co-founder and newly named CEO of the Sadie Collective aims to hold these doors open for those who will follow her. Ms. Brittany Wilcher will lead our conversation tonight. Ms. Wilcher is a PhD candidate in applied microeconomics at American University and a Spelman alum. I would like to thank her for lending her time and expertise to this event. I would also like to thank the students at Spelman College for being a part of this conversation. We are so grateful that you are able to join us tonight. Before I turn it over to our esteemed guests, I would like to ask our audience to help us create a safe and inclusive environment for all participants. Before you send that comment or question, please take a moment to reflect on how others might perceive your language. Thank you all for coming and for helping us create a respectful space where all feel welcome to listen, to share, and to enjoy. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce Ms. Wilcher and Ms. Traore to this digital stage. Welcome to the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation's Unscripted Series, where we'll, we're hearing from the top minds in STEM. Again, I'm Brittany Wilcher, an economist, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Chatting with me today is Fanta Traore. So Fanta Traore is an economist and entrepreneur. Fanta's desire to serve marginalized people across the globe brought her to Yale, where she currently studies economic development, management, and public-private partnerships. Prior to Yale, Fanta worked as a senior research assistant in the Federal Reserve System's International Finance Division, analyzing cross-border transaction and the impact of financial market development on inequality. Fanta also worked in the social entrepreneurship ecosystem, leveraging her data analysis skills for social impact and brokering partnerships across Francophone Africa for over 100 organizations on behalf of Echo and Green and the Anzantia Prize. Fanta co-founded the Sadie Collective, the only organization dedicated to addressing the pipeline for Black women in economics and related fields, and is on the board of directors of Women and Kids Empowerment Academy, a US-based nonprofit serving teens and young women from Guinea, West Africa. She's been featured on countless news outlets from NPR, Fortune, Forbes, to the World Economic Forum. She was recognized as a global shaper by the World Economic Forum. 
Fanta speaks French, Arabic, Mandika, as well as English, and has worked across Sub-Saharan Africa, traveling to over 15 countries across the continent. She's a proud alumna of Howard University and graduated summa cum laude with dual degrees in economics and political science. Fanta was born and raised in what she describes as a Malian household in the Bronx and Harlem. Thanks for joining me today, Fanta. Thank you so much, Brittany, for that wonderful introduction. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today. And I am so glad that you could join me. So thank you. I really appreciate your presence here. And I also would like to thank the National Science, Technology, and Metals Foundation for having us. Elsie, Andy, Ryan, and Allison, thank you for all of the legwork that you all put in putting this event together, as well as Spellman's Economics Department and also Howard's Economics Department. It's a pleasure to be here. And I also just want to name the fact that Brittany is incredibly established and is someone that I've always looked up to. She and I met in 2017 at the American Economic Association summer program and there she was a teaching assistant and I was a student in the program and we spent a lot of long nights working through some probability theory problem sets that I would not have made it through if it were not for her. So as we're having this conversation, please know that Brittany is also someone that you can pose questions to about the world of economics and I'm excited for us to kick it off. Oh, well, thank you, Fanta. It's just a pleasure to see how you've grown over the years. I'm excited now that the world gets to see it too. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, beginning with uh, your career, right? So there were actually quite a few pre-questions submitted and people are really interested in learning more about how you got on this very unique and impactful path that you are. So I was wondering if you could describe a bit for the audience, your current field and how you ended up on this career path. Absolutely. So the way I would break it down is into two categories, economics and entrepreneurship. The economics aspect of it is looking at who gets what, where, when, and how. And the way that I explore that question has been through doing economic research and I think what's really cool about this space is that you can really color the kinds of work that you do based off of the experiences that you have. So for instance, if you are someone who's interested in health, you're able to ask economic questions that relate to the health field. If you're someone who's interested in Africa and development economics, for instance, you're able to bring all of those experiences to inform the kind of questions that you ask. So that's something Thing that I'm currently doing now through my dual degree program, using those experiences that I've accrued over the years to inform the kinds of questions that I ask. As far as the entrepreneurship ones, that's really speaking to the idea of taking risk and creating something through taking that risk. Um, so for instance, for me, what that looks like is the Sadie Collective. And I took a risk on starting this organization with my co-founder. And now we're in a really great place. And it, it's been a, an amazing and incredible journey to have started this organization. And as far as how both of them I am marrying together currently, I am using my dual degree as a vehicle for exploring both of those interests. So with my courses, I'm able to kind of intersect my interest in economics research with doing research that directly relates to the Sadie Collective. Great. And while we're on the topic of the Sadie Collective, there were definitely some questions from the audience about um, the direction of the organization, in addition to how people can join. So if you could let those out there know how they can get involved in um, maybe some of the upcoming activities that may present themselves. Absolutely. So the Sadie Collective, for those of you who are not aware, is a pipeline and pathway organization dedicated to Black women's advancement in economics and related fields. I co-founded the organization with my wonderful co-founder, Anna Gifty Apoku Adjaman. And we both met in 2018 and came up with this idea. Actually, yeah, yeah, it was 2018. Came up with this idea for 
addressing the needs for Black women in this space as we were learning more about the lack of Black women in economics. In fact, we were introduced to research from the National Economic Association's president at the time, Dr. Rhonda Vonche Sharp, who was showing that the rate of Black women entering economics was actually declining over time. And that was just like super mind blowing for us. So we thought, okay, in order to address this, let's get all the Black women that we know in a room who've been encouraging us to go into economics and kind of get a sense of why they decided to pursue this field. And it continued to grow from there. So for anyone who would like to learn more about the Sadie Collective, I'm sure we'll touch more on it through this conversation. You can visit www.sadiecollective.org slash join. And that's where you will be able to join our network for members. And it's important for us to note as well that in order to join to be a member, you don't have to be a Black woman. Our work requires allies and their commitment as well. And we have thought deeply about how to provide services and information to allies as well so that they are able to engage with what we're trying to do here to make economics accessible for everyone. Oh, wow, that's great. So you're clearly juggling a lot. You're a grad student, CEO of the Sadie Collective. Um, for those of students out there who might be interested in kind of a non-traditional path, such as what you've taken, could you describe a bit what your day-to-day -day sort of work looks like and um, elaborate how you integrate that with your interest in using data for social impact? Absolutely. So... Oh, yeah. So in answering that question, I'll say that my days are abundantly filled. So I start off with uh, prioritizing my graduate school work and then the Sadie Collective and then myself. And I specifically mentioned myself because I think it's very easy for us to put ourselves on the back burner because we're trying to do so much. And it's it's the case that Black women are doing so much and juggling so much and saving the world, as we saw with the most recent elections and Stacey Abrams coming in and saving the day. Um, and, and with that, I just wanted to you know, particularly notes that it's important that we are prioritizing um, ourselves. So with, with graduate school, what that looks like for me is my courses. So I have a few courses throughout the week. I also have readings that I have to do for those courses to make sure that I am um, on track for, for when I show up to class as much of those courses are participation based and focus on you engaging with other students and sharing what you've learned and also coloring what you are reading with your work experience and that lens that you uniquely provide. And then with the Sadie Collective, it's, um, with the entrepreneurship space, there's a lot of unpredictability. So there is like no typical week, but I do find myself in quite a few meetings with different foundation leaders. And actually just yesterday, we were in a meeting with the Gates Foundation and kind of teaching them about what we've learned about economics thus far through the work that we're doing to make the field more accessible. And that was an incredible conversation that we had there. And it was really an honor to be able to provide the insights that we have had there. Um, and as far as other activities with the Sadie Collective, there are meetings that I'm having with team members. We're a team of 16 volunteers at the moment. So making sure that everyone has what they need so that they can execute on bringing our vision to life. And then with the me part, I basically integrate that throughout my day. So when I start my day, I start with prayer. I start with eating and going for a run. I then check my email for a little bit and just like get a sense of what's going on there. Try not to spend too much time there as emails can really be such a time sink. And then I move on to going to class. I check um, some of the readings that I have to do and do those readings. And then I have a few meetings that I am in or preparing for for the next day. And that kind of gives you a sense of what my rhythm is like. And then by seven is what I we are committed to not doing anything else after seven. So um, yeah, it can be easy for things to spill over, but because I start my day at five, I need an endpoint, And I like to 
take myself to bed rather than collapse on my couch. And sometimes that happens. <laughs> so in order to avoid that, I told myself seven is when I cut off and I call a friend, I call a family and use that as a way to catch up. Well, that's amazing. I love the balance uh, that you prioritized in life. And so I'm curious, right? So I think everything that you do, you're clearly a leader, you are doing the thing. And so um, for those who aspire to uh, have a leadership role one day in life, um, could you speak a bit more about how you gain the expertise to thrive as a leader and kind of some of the factors that you think may have contributed to your um, success, your professional su success and your kind of progression to this point of being the CEO? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I would say the two main factors are my home environment and also just being the product of Black people giving back to their community. So with my home environment, what that looked like was being the oldest of three siblings, also being a girl, and also being born to Francophone immigrants. So what does all of that mean? Being a girl and being the oldest means that I just had more responsibility. And with that, that means I am the first to go to college in my family, right? So there was like some things that my parents hinted at, like you should go to college, you should do all of these things, um, but there wasn't necessarily a roadmap that was available to me. So it meant kind of just finding that path for myself and with my parents not necessarily being familiar with the U.S. system, I had to do the research and figure it out and learn it on my own. And in fact, in New York City, where I grew up, there is definitely an element of where you have to choose your own middle school. You have to choose your own high school. You have to choose your own university as well. And in doing all of that, I heard the direction that my parents gave me of like, you definitely have to go to college. And I was like, okay. Um, but then they were also like, you can also go to any college that you want and it can be, um, any, any school that you want and free. <laughs> and with that, I like just looked into all of these different programs that would help to support me on my journey. And a lot of those programs were led by Black folks in the New York area. And so that looks like the College Awareness Symbolizes Hope program, which was with the National Black MBA Association. And they gave me a computer, they gave me mentors, they gave me a lot that would then make it easier for my own path and journey. I got a scholarship from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I was also supported by the Harlem YMCA. Um, and they also supported some of my um, college endeavors and internships and whatnot. And um, in all of those endeavors, what was an incentive for me at the time was just like free food and also wanting to hang out with my friends <laughs> and get out okay. of those responsibilities that I had because <laughs> those responsibilities of having to wash the dishes and do the laundry, I could get out of that if I could tell my parents that I was doing what they told me to do, which was to find this money to go to school. Uh, so all of those incentives went into me and my own personal journey and kind Kind of figuring out how to create what it is that I want. And my parents set that vision for me. But what I found over the years is that when I was able to then identify a vision for myself, I could then use those skills that I've learned on how to find these scraps and like make things happen. So then when I went on to Howard University, I came across the African Students Association. And at that time, it was actually kind of uh, starting to fall apart. And me and some friends, we got together and we reestablished the organization. And we were able to do so much through that entity. We connected with other African Students Associations across the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. We collaborated on events. We didn't have any funding as an organization, but we had that power of community where we could then leverage that to allow engagements and also the name of Howard to allow um, people to be interested in what we were trying to do and create. And it led us to starting to get dues from students and using that money to then provide scholarships for students who are part of the African Immigrant Refugee Foundation in the DMV area. And we engaged with like the Office of African Affairs and all of these entities. But um, what, what I think um, allowed us to do that as well 
is my parents also just teaching us how, as far as like my family goes on how to be scrappy. Like my dad and his income, like when we look at that now in the context of New York City, it's actually impossible for a family of six to be raised on that. But he never made it aware to us that we were Pell Grant eligible and actually struggling. And in fact, he was still sending money back home, taking care of family members back home. Mm -hmm. And seeing that and being brought up in that has definitely been an asset for my own journey. And in fact, I also was able to start an organization on campus um, and rather prototype it called the YALI program, the Young Africana Leadership Initiative. And I actually think one of my professors who is now spearheading and leading that initiative is with us today. So Dr. Yapua, if you're here, hello. <laughs> and that was an entity that was created based on looking at data. And so the data that I was looking at as a member of student council was looking at the rate of black people studying abroad. And having gone to Mali, just that summer, right before I started at Howard, I saw the value of being able to go to the continent and to really just get a sense of the realities on the ground and explore opportunities for service and whatnot. So when I interviewed for a position with the student council and talked a lot about community service and interest in community service, I said a lot about like this international element and how we should explore that. And that eventually led to the creation of an initiative for getting more Black students abroad. And when we're looking at the data around who has passports, um, it's pretty low for the Black community. So that was used to inform the creation of this program, which still exists to this day. And in that, there were proposals that were shared to the Howard University Students Association Senate and different entities to make that funding accessible so that we could get this program to be established. Um, so, so those are some of the ways that I've used data as a student on campus. And I, yeah, and I, and I found that to yield into creating opportunities that were um, then accessible widely. Oh, wow. Well, if I must say, on behalf of everyone, uh, I think the world is a better place having you as a leader, having oh. someone who has these <laughs> skills to use this data for a greater purpose and to effectuate change. And so I love that you were out there just doing the work um, and doing the service of diversity and inclusion, although it didn't necessarily have that panel um, um, banner as you described it now. But mm. I think, you know, it's the buzzword, it's what everyone is talking about um, post the craziness that was 2020. And so I want to actually dive a bit more into doing that sort of diversity and inclusion work and really thinking about um, how we value the work of women in color in that space, women of color in that space, right? So you're definitely doing um, that sort of work, particularly in economics and economics related fields uh, as a part of Sadie Collective. Um, and so I'm curious as to why you believe that diversity is important um, in economics and related fields specifically. Yes, oh man, I mean, it's economics is everywhere in terms of this concept of power and distribution. And when we look at how that affects black and brown communities and the lack of power that is within those communities, it's really frustrating. And so this concept, Black Women Best, is what the Sadie Collective centers and is about. And the idea is that if we center the economy around Black women, then it will actually work better for everyone else. And the question that is posed about this um, is, well, when was, the, when was the economy ever working for Black women, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a term, Black Women Best is a term that's coined by the current Department of Labor Chief Economist, Janelle. Where'd she go to school? Where'd she go to Spelman? We love to see that, yes. <laughs> So Janelle is fantastic and it's so great to see her as the first black woman in that position. And also Dr. Cecilia Rouse, who is currently the first black woman on the center, um, the council rather for, um, for economics, um, Council of Economic Advisors. She highlighted in an interview recently how important it is 
for data to be disaggregated and consider race and gender. So when she was asked about how are you going to measure success of policies, she responded with, it depends on what we're seeing on a disaggregated basis. And this is really, really great to see like these women in these positions and talking about looking at the economy from a lens where it wasn't looked at before. And so initially we've been doing a lot of work around the unemployment rate, the aggregate unemployment rate and, and not considering the fact that the disaggregated unemployment rate shows that Black women aren't doing well in the economy as are other racial groups. And there's a huge opportunity there. And I'm really excited to see that institutions that are incredibly powerful now have these Black women in particular in these positions who can then ask these critical questions so that the many Black women and Latinx and Indigenous women who are being identified as essential workers right now and who are the engine of the economy are honored and that we see better opportunities for them in terms of paid sick leave or unionized jobs. My mom, she is an essential worker and she's been lucky in that she's had a unionized job recently and prior to about two years ago, she did not have a unionized job. And so what that's meant um, has meant that she could take sick leave and that if she were to get COVID, she could actually take time off. So it's really nice to see that we're moving and shifting in this direction. And this is why economics and, um, and seeing diversity in this space is absolutely critical. Oh, yes, absolutely. And so, um, as you know, there's kind of historically been this erasure of the work of women of color, in particular Black women. And so I think what that means, I, sitting in the, the place that students are in today, or even you and I, as we build our career, um, one of the kind of questions for me is, how do you ensure, um, how do you advocate for yourself to ensure that you are justly recognized, justly compensated for your intellectual um, contributions, may it be um, in, an academic space or the workplace. And so I'm curious if you can give us, me and other students out there, um, some examples of how you've actually advocated for yourself um, in conversations with maybe a, a teacher or a boss and kind of what steps you took if you felt like um, you may have not been recognized for your contributions. Absolutely. I love this question because it takes me back to when I first entered the workplace and I was not great at this. In fact, I was very much of a clock in clock out kind of person. And I would look around at my colleagues and see them enjoying each other's company. And I was kind of like, well, that's great. I'm leaving. <laughs> and they are all really wonderful people. Mm -hmm. However, for me, I, I was just really confused as to how integrated they were with one another. And that's when I realized that there is actually quite a big distinction between just having a job and then having a career. And when I learned more about this concept of having a career through having mentors who were helping to guide me along the way and reading a lot on muse.com and also just speaking to friends who are building out their own careers, it made me realize, okay, I need to go about this a little differently. And so what that looked like was creating community in the workplace and also recognizing that when it comes to getting your next job and your next job, um, which are all tied to your career mission, what's important for that is your networks. And as they say, your network is your net worth. And I did not know that when I started out. And I guess I was kind of just observing what I was seeing in people around me in, in, um, in terms of being first generation and that's the kind of jobs that my aunties and my uncles had, clock in, clock out. Like you're not kikiing with your <laughs> with um, with your colleagues. Maybe you like each other, but it's like not a priority. And mm -hmm. so understanding the politics of the workplace was very important for my own journey. And speaking to other friends and mentorship was also incredibly important. I will say though, for that job where I was still learning these things, I was intentional about negotiation because that was something that I heard about. And so in that, I use what I've learned from traveling and being um, in developing countries and kind of just like haggling at the market. So 
<laughs> and seeing a pair of waist beads that I like, I will go to the person and be like, okay, so this is my um, first price. And then, you know, you keep going back and forth. And I use those exact same tactics in terms of then negotiating my, my job and its pay. And, um, and with that, what that looks like is understanding your value and really knowing that and being able to communicate that. And I was so nervous in that conversation where I was negotiating my salary. Um, but I, even though the words they were like, I felt like I was rambling and it was stumbling over each other, I did get that raise. Um, so that's also something that's really important to be able to do for yourself. And then Another thing that I found really important is to have regular check-ins with my manager. And that's something that's not guaranteed at every job. And so in that, um, when I learned that that was really important and I transitioned to another role, I made that a priority. So as soon as I went into that workplace that I um, transitioned to, I had regular check-ins with my manager every two weeks. I let him know what I was working on. And he also let me know what he was working on, which is great because then now I can know how to support him and to help guide him um, in, in knowing how to support me and be invested in the kinds of things and questions that I'm thinking about. And it led to doing some really exciting research that I would not have had happen if he and I didn't have that open line of communication. And um, the, the last point that I would mention is related to this letter that I drafted and made available to people broadly during the whole like George Floyd moment. So mm -hmm. this letter was about people advocating for themselves um, given the recent death of George Floyd. And basically at that moment, I was just so frustrated and I felt that it was necessary for my institution to address what happened. And so I started to ask around to friends and be like, hey, like, do you know if there's like any kind of like letter I could send to my employer where they can address this really heavy issue that's happening? Like, I actually cannot function and come to work on Monday unless they address this. So I asked around and it turns out nobody has actually seen like this kind of letter and I just started to draft it. And it's because I don't like to see myself going through like a certain level of trauma and pain and then know that there are other people out there going through something similar mm -hmm. and like not be a part of the solution. And so mm -hmm. in drafting a letter to my employer, I then made it into a template and made it easily available and accessible to other people who may have been going through the same thing. And that letter has actually been circulated quite a number of times so that individuals could advocate for themselves. So those are some of the ways, yeah, that I've showed up for myself. I love it. I, I just love the practical solutions or being the solution that we need for ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's amazing. And so I'm not sure if you um, actually have had to actually seek out development opportunities or um, safe spaces outside of the workplace or school um, oh, in your course. case. Um, yeah, so could you speak to more about um, how you sought out some of these development opportunities uh, outside of your school or workplace to create a safe space for you to find affirmations for your achievements and for your contributions? Yes. So enter the Sadie Collective. I would not have survived at the Fed without it. <laughs> and, and I say that like knowing that there is a really great community in the DC Fed of Howard RAs, as well as American Economic Association Summer Program um, participants. But the Sadie Collective was like, there's, there's that unique intersection of race and gender. And mm -hmm. I, I'm sure all the Spelman women know here, like it's, a, it's unique and it's special to have that community of black women in particular. So to start building out that organization while I was at the Fed and to have that community of where there are many women who are the only ones in their institutions and entities and to be dreaming of something bigger than ourselves and working together and collaborating and also bouncing ideas off of each other or just like being good friends. And, and, and that's what's really great about our team of volunteers. We're all 
good friends. And so to have that community was really, really valuable. And I, um, yeah, I, so that was a huge resource for me. Um, but then also what's, what the Sadie Collective is about too, is that it's an intergenerational community. So when Anna and I started the organization, we were also thinking about how can we lend the mentors that we have and share them more broadly, understanding that there is this dearth of, um, of knowledge access and information access flow. Like how do we just bring all of that together? And, and so, so that community has been critical um, for me in terms of being a safe space and a place to uh, be cultivated. Another community that I found valuable was the American Economic Association Summer Program. So that's how you and I met. Um, and apart from those two, I am a part of the Public Policy and International Affairs Program alumni group. And that was also pretty valuable as well. In fact, the executive director serves as a mentor to me and we're so excited to have her on the advisory board for the Sadie Collective. Um, so, so that's also a community of people of color who are really passionate about using policy tools to affect change. And actually that's where I was introduced to economic research. And that program, was during the summer between my junior year and my senior year. And it really just blew my mind because what happened was they took all of these young people who are leaders on their campuses and doing really great work, um, but who are in liberal arts and not from a quantitative lens and introduced them to quant. And one of the people who came to interact with us during that um, program was a policymaker in New York who explicitly used economic research to introduce a supermarket in Harlem. And I grew up in Harlem and I knew exactly where she was talking about. She introduced a pathmark to 125th and Lexington. I walked past there Let all the time. Know. Let them know. And I was just mind blown because she used economic research to transform trajectories in that area. And that's when I was like, okay, like clearly I need economics in my life. And I went back to Howard's campus and I declared an econ major. And I ended up taking 10 classes that year and ended up with a dual degree um, and it was hectic, but it was so worthwhile. And I'm glad that I had that exposure and that experience. So for anyone who is not yet in their junior year, I highly recommend that program um, because it also gives you a pool of funding that's accessible to you if you're interested in pursuing a master's in public policy. So when I applied to policy schools and got in, I didn't have to worry about funding because it also comes with a stipend too and tuition being covered after doing that program. And I'm so glad that I stumbled across that application. Um, so definitely keep your eye out for that. Oh, well, thank you for that. And so we have about five minutes left of our discussion before we transition to our Q&A, but there's some um, one thing that I really wanna make sure that we get to before we do transition to Q&A. And that is really thinking about kind of the black woman in society. And so unfortunately, society sometimes ascribes stereotypes to us, which might not just limit our opportunities, but also our sense of self, our perspective of self. And I've actually thought about this a lot going, as I've grown as a professional and um, going through a PhD process. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak to our audience about this idea of limiting and empowering beliefs um, and how you um, actually manage these ideas. So um, did you ever subscribe to beliefs that may in a sense have limited goals that you pursued? And if so, where do you think those um, beliefs stem from? maybe like society, friends, family. And um, on the front of empowering beliefs, how did you overcome those limiting beliefs? Um, did you replace them with uh, affirmations? I would love to hear about how you've managed um, these sort of thoughts that can sometimes take over our minds when we're venturing out into spaces where there might not be many of us um, and there might be others who actually feel somewhat of a stereotype threat by us entering those spaces. So if you could speak to this idea of limiting and empowering beliefs for others. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So limiting beliefs. Ooh, yes. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy to come across them and to embody them. And I would say one of the experiences that kind of reflects a limiting belief that I had is my relationship with the GRE. So mm -hmm. I took that exam five times. <laughs> and that basically meant it took three months out of my life every year until I got here to, to, to Yale's program. And in that, um, there was definitely this idea of like, if I am not seeing a score that shows I am smart, then I won't be able to accomplish like so much. Um, and so the way I've navigated that in particular is recognizing that the score that I have on this exam um, actually doesn't represent anything. And it took me a while to get there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the last exam that I took <laughs> that I actually like got to that point. And that's because I was so fatigued and taking the test. And in fact, I actually got a score that was like, I'd never seen anything like this in any of my practices. Mm -hmm. It was bad, it was just bad. Um, at that point, my body was just like, we're over this, like, why are we still doing this? And I ended up submitting my second score that I got. Um, and, and the reason why I share that is because at that point, um, even now, like when I reflect on hearing back from policy programs and MBA programs and getting in, I know for certain it wasn't my GRE score that got me in. It was the experiences that I've accrued over time and the assets that I've accrued over time that these schools were interested in. And in negotiating with the schools and the programs about what kind of financial aid package I should have, et cetera, um, it made me realize how much leverage I had. Um, so I do think that with some limiting beliefs that it's time that will help you to navigate those problems and those ideas and perceptions that we have of ourselves. Um, others I would say is as far as being a black woman and um, growing up in, um, in a, a home where marriage is something to aspire to um, rather than like thinking about your career, et cetera. Um, that's also something that's come up for me. And what has also helped with that is time and kind of just like my parents being able to see and appreciate all of it is that I have been able to do outside of this like aspiration that's often associated with um, being successful. Um, and, and empowering beliefs for me would be, would have been established through affirmations. Um, and so, and so what that has looked like was, and a particular experience comes to mind and that's with, um, Quentin Johnson, who used to work at the Fed and who's basically my big brother. Um, <laughs> didn't he go to Morehouse? Uh, yes, he did go to Morehouse. He has a oh, Morehouse house again. <laughs> Yes. So <laughs> shout out to Kamala in the White House, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we give you that. <laughs> no, we love all HBCUs. Yes, right? so, um, yeah, so Quentin is incredible. And basically, he was hired uh, a few months before I joined the Fed. And the reason why I bring him up in this conversation about empowering beliefs is because for my first couple of months when I entered the Fed, I was unlike who I am in that <laughs> you couldn't recognize me in that like I was slicking my hair back and like for a hot second just like trying to blend in which mm -hmm. like no doesn't make sense to do at all like Anyway, so for like a couple of weeks, I was like in this phase of like, do I belong here? And just really doubting myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a conversation with Quentin. We heard a bit about each other from like different people and we finally met and we had a conversation. And as we were talking, he stated a few affirmations and those affirmations, I started to say to myself literally like every day. And they were, I am capable, I am competent, I can do it, I am confident to conquer. 
And mm. it was like poetry, right? Can it was, you say that again? Can you say that? Again? I am capable. I am competent. I can do it. I am confident to conquer. And these were what he termed in that moment as the five C's. Mm. And that led me to further exploring this idea of mirror talk, which Lisa Nichols is an empowerment um, speaker. And she talks about that a lot. And I definitely recommend checking her out. She's so... She's, she's incredible. And she introduced me to this idea of mirror talk. And what mirror talk is, is that you speak to yourself in the mirror and you say seven things you're proud of, seven things you forgive yourself for, and seven things you commit to. And that was a practice that I started to implement like every day. And I needed to do that as I was starting to grow the collective and um, needing to work through ego and being a person of service and like all of these different things that come up with leading an entity and also juggling full-time work and adjusting to a new workplace and mirror talk I found to be incredibly helpful and then another recommendation I would make is um, this activity where you write down what the limiting belief is and you cross it out and you replace it with an empowering one and that's something that I do regularly like if I um, feel nervous about an activity that I plan to do, I write out how, okay, let's say the activity is, I am worried about um, giving a keynote. Um, I will then write out, I am not a good public speaker, cross it out and say, I have given talks before and I have communicated well. So that's an example of like how you would use that. Oh, well, thank you, Fanta. I mean, it's just been such a pleasure hearing about your um, career path and how you've managed to really change the landscape of diversity and inclusion and economics, as well as how you empower yourself and speak life into yourself. And so I hope that that has also spoken some life into our audience. And um, I really appreciate this opportunity to chat with you today. And so I want to actually give an opportunity for our audience to ask questions. So we would love to hear from you out there, our viewers um, on the internet. <laughs> so please go ahead and um, submit your questions using Slido and we'll go ahead and um, fire those off to Fanta. Okay, so looks like we have a few that are that have come in. Um, and this actually came up in the set of pre questions as well. And so actually, can you speak to advice for people that are first time programmers and um, some tips you would offer on someone interested in learning about programming, which is an essential part of of data analysis and developing those sort of data analysis skills, maybe outside of a classroom? in or outside the classroom? Sure, yes. Yeah. So after working at the Fed, I did a lot of research and policy work and I only came in with data knowledge. And so there was a lot of learning on the job. And what that looks like is essentially learning the basics of a language and knowing how to Google it. <laughs> and so once you really know how to do that, you can add it to your resume, okay? So um, what I would recommend is take a course and, you know, explore, explore that course and get a sense of the basics of the language. So let's say you were in a position like myself and you knew Stata, but you didn't know R, then what you would do is go on one of these um, data camp is, is a website that you can look mm -hmm. at. Um, there are quite a few websites and a few that use um, free coding advice and make that accessible. And you get a sense of like the basics of the language. And then the best way to learn is by doing. So once you have the basics of the language, explore a question that interests you and that excites you and try to get the data together for that and start to use your newfound language skills to then do some research and answer an inter interesting question. So let's say you're interested in questions around development and you 
gather a data set from the World Bank, you gather a data set from the IMF, and you're trying to learn how to merge data sets. You then would look into um, Googling around R, merging data sets, um, and then you'll find like a lot of information out there on the internet, and Stack Exchange is a good one where you can find some resources there. Um, and you would then use that exercise to learn that skill. So doing it piece by piece is, is a way to go. Identify what it is that you want to learn. Um, identify what it is that you're trying to create. So let's say you're trying to create bar charts. Understand what the pieces are to create that bar chart. Do you need to merge data? And then do you need to transform that data one way or another? Um, but overall, I would say that actually being in the weeds and um, trying it by doing is the way to go. I hope that's helpful. What about for you, Brittany? What would you recommend? I totally actually want to echo the advice that Fonta has just offered. So uh, it might be the way that I learn, but I learn um, a lot by doing. And so I think really actually diving into um, working with a program, may it be R, may it be Python, may it be Stata or SAS, and kind of learning the foundational language will you'll have limitless um, sort of capability to transition from program to program. And one thing that I think is super helpful, which I wish I would have done a bit more, um, even, even prior to entering a PhD program is trying to replicate published papers mm -hmm. um, and using that as an opportunity to um, learn not just the programming, but how researchers think go about asking the question and executing the analysis to address that question. So all of what Fonta just shared is applicable to that process. Plus you'll be able to see, um, be able to compare what you're finding to what the actual published authors in these peer reviewed journals have produced. And I think that, um, I don't know, in a sense, may be a bit of a confidence boost. I know it would be for me to know that, hey, I'm doing something that these people with X, Y, Z level of training are, are doing, and um, I'm building upon that. And I'm also learning a new sort of program or software. And I know there are tons of, as Fonta mentioned, sort of uh, free resources. Um, now that life is sort of virtual, um, there are all these free boot camps um, that I would definitely keep an eye on for, like the Correlation One. Yeah. I think Fonta and I have talked about that. Um, um, uh, which specifically targets uh, minorities, I believe. I mean, I think they have uh, di different programs, but there are boot camps specifically designed for, for you. And so I would definitely um, uh, seek those out like Correlation One um, and do additional sort of digging on the internet. And I'm sure we'd be happy. I mean, I'd be happy to discuss yeah. further if you'd like to reach out to me mm -hmm. about other resources. Mm -hmm. And Code Academy is a great one as well. And as the Sadie Collective continues to grow, these are all the kinds of resources that we're looking to have easily accessible on our website. So look out for our membership portal. We're working on having that out to you all sometime in the June timeframe. Um, so join as a member if you have not yet. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. And so one thing that you actually touched upon when we were speaking earlier is that you and Anna wanted to share your network with others as a part of the Sadie Collective, right? And so I was wondering, and I remember when I was just starting out in my career, I, I was curious as to how, how does one build this network? How do you establish these sorts of um, relationships? And so we have a question from Melanie out there um, and she wants to know your advice uh, for undergrad students pursuing a degree in economics and trying to build a network in the field and how to create sort of that supportive circle for them to get from, I'm adding Melanie, but to get from point A to point B being their ultimate professional goal. Mm, that's a really lovely question. Okay, so one of the resources that we found really helpful was Econ Twitter. So definitely recommend getting on there. And there are some pages like Econ RA Jobs that you can follow. Um, and there's Predoc, that's a new emerging one that exposes one to opportunities for predoctoral programs. Um, but just Econ Twitter has been really great in terms of connecting with leaders across the economic profession and getting a sense of what kind of questions interest them and what kind of policy questions are really hot right now and getting a sense of what the conversations are about right now. Um, so, so that's um, kind of like a 
low touch way to get plugged into the community searching up the hashtag econ twitter and seeing what people are talking about and following economists who you find interesting and then i would add checking out organizations that have a mission that ties to your interest. So there are organizations like the Health Economist Association, there's the National Economic Association, um, and there are quite a few, some are more affinity group focused, some are subject area focus. So there are groups for feminist economists. There are groups who are interested in labor economics as well. So getting a sense of what those organizations are and joining their newsletter and getting more information about what they are doing. And then there are communities like Research in Color where you can get paired with a mentor. And then there are communities like the Sadie Collective where you can get with, paired with a mentor as well and also get plugged into some of the other initiatives and events that we that we are having. So I recommend checking out all of those different resources that exist there, but then also really taking a look at who's around you and who is in your classroom. Like your classmates are huge assets. And I've, I've created a group chat recently that's like accountability buddies for finding internships. Um, and that's other classmates who are looking for internships and we're just like connecting and making sure we're sharing resources and holding each other accountable and checking in on a regular basis. And your classmates are a huge asset and they are the people that you are going to be climbing this career ladder with and who, when you're looking for a job, they're the people that will know about you and who you build a camaraderie with and who will be interested um, in helping you and uh, being on that road and that journey with you. So those are some of my um, quick suggestions. But I'll also add that one of the connections that have changed my life is connecting with Anna, who is also my age mate. Um, and actually, so she and I, our relationship started off as mentor and mentee, and then we just became good friends. And then we became co-founders. So I understand that like for those of you who are with Spelman, there's like an entrepreneurship curriculum that's being introduced and your co-founders are your classmates. So mm -hmm. definitely tap into those resources, um, which are your classmates <laughs> and um, get to know them. Like connecting with Anna has literally changed my life. And that um, really just speaks to the power of the individuals who are right next to you. Right. Oh, well, thank you for that. And um, if I may add on to that, mm -hmm. also, I think um, when I was an undergraduate, I was kind of afraid to just reach out to people. Mm -hmm. And so I want to reiterate that it's okay to coldly, blindly, email someone if you find that you've read their research paper and you think it's fascinating or they have a career that you are just fascinated by and you're interested in doing something similar. And what I had to learn is that it's okay if people don't respond, um, but it's really great when they do. So some people would ignore my emails, but it was really exciting when people would respond um, to these kind of requests for informational interviews. And I think um, sometimes organic sort of relationships, long term relationships can also develop out of that because you do share um, a specific sort of interest. And honestly, it's an honor for someone to be reached out to, right? Like, right. I've actually, I've been surprised when people have reached out to me. And it's, it's quite exciting um, that at least what they find what I'm doing interesting. I thought it was just me, um, but it's always an honor. And so I think you kind of sift and sort and you get the right people. The right people respond. That's what I've learned in life. So that's, um, it doesn't always have to be extremely formal. Um, these great programs, I think that's, as Bonta pointed out, that's a great place to start. Um, but it's also okay if you see someone's profile on LinkedIn or especially someone's a professor and you read their paper, it's okay to reach out to them. And um, I definitely wouldn't fear that process. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to, to add that piece. Um, but Vonta, back to you, <laughs> this is about you. Um, I was wondering what advice, um, we have a question from Alicia. Um, what advice would you give your 18 year old self? Mm. I would tell my 18 year old self that everything is going to be okay. It's okay that you're an undecided major, you're going to figure it out. You should just continue to pursue what it is that's exciting you, what's interesting you, and 
you'll be surprised at how pursuing that allows you to go to all of these different places and to be of service to, um, to, to people in ways that if you were just listening to other people's ideas about what would make you successful, you um, wouldn't be as happy. So um, th that's what I would tell my 18 year old self. Um, yeah, I love that question. Wow, yeah, at 18, I did not know what I was going to be studying. And it was actually um, my cousin passing away my sophomore year that kind of helped to solidify my interest and my career path. So she was only 20 years old when she died and her life was cut short. And in learning about her death is when I was reminded by a statement from a high school teacher that I had who said, whatever it is that makes you angry and impassioned is what you should look at building your career on. Mm -hmm. And so I went from being undecided and studying political science with a concentration on Africa because I wanted to further explore what are the realities on the ground that inform the African experience. And let me give some context to my cousin and her life. So Neva um, was full of so much joy and light. And in 2011, when my whole family went to Mali, we um, met her and she was basically like my go-to person. So if I had any questions about like just how things are in Mali, Although like I did grow up with knowing my language, I only spent ages four to six there. And so when we went and we visited, she was there to answer all of my many questions and was just so bubbly. And she was telling me about how she was interested in becoming a nurse. And it was very fitting because she was super caring and kind. And it um, was, it was, it was really jarring to learn about her passing away and the context of everything that happened. So, so what happened was that she was pursuing her high school diploma. Um, she, we were both around the same age. So she was pursuing her high school diploma. And when I was graduating from high school, she had took the test the first time um, that would allow her to get her diploma. And then she failed it. Um, and what happens is if you fail this test twice in one region, you are not able to go to university and pursue your dreams. And during my freshman year, she went ahead and tried to take the exam again um, and she failed it. So that meant that at this point, she should just be counting herself out. Mm -hmm. However, Neba was very determined and persistent. So she's like, okay, well, this means that I can now go to another region and take the test again, and then I will become this nurse. And so she went ahead and went to this other region and she was just supposed to be there for a couple of months. And she was also diabetic and ran out of her insulin. And so in that region, she was prescribed a medication that was incompatible with her. And that ultimately led to her passing away. And whew, yeah, so, so in that, it made me realize a lot of things um, that I am frustrated with and it's the systems that she was operating in. And it, it really highlighted how opportunity is not equally distributed um, because of the country that she was born in and the policies and the rules and regulations that exist in, in Mali, she wasn't able to pursue her dreams. And it left me with many questions like, what if she was able to, not have to take this uh, this exam so many times. Um, this exam has a 20% pass rate and it's based off of the French education system. And all of those components raise questions for me. Um, and similarly in the US context, it, that's what we're seeing with zip codes. The zip code that you are born in can inform your outcomes and your experiences. And that draws me back to economics and really being impassioned about inequality and being a part of the solution there. So when I think about people like Niba and also black women who are essential workers here in the US, it 
raises this question of what is it that we deserve? And I, I feel so honored and grateful that through the Sadie Collective, I can help to kind of affect that change in some respects. And, um, and yeah, she, she continues to motivate and inspire me to this day. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And so uh, are there any other motivators that you have um, that keep you moving forward to to break these barriers that we see, that these persistent barriers that have existed in economics and related fields? Yes, I think about Dr. Sadie T.M. Alexander. She is incredible. 23 years old, graduating with a PhD in 1921, like during a time where America is segregated and being the first black economist, not first black woman economist, but first black, like that is incredibly powerful. Um, and so her legacy is huge and we have the honor of being able to carry that on through the Sadie Collective and it's really meant the world to have her daughter see our work and be like wow this is incredible and prior to these conversations she wasn't seeing her mother as an economist because she never had the chance to practice mm -hmm. but many of the speeches that Dr. Sadie T.M. Alexander has left behind really point to economics and her love for Black women and what they deserve and some of her policies that she talks about also highlights this idea of an economy working for everyone needs to include Black women. So she definitely motivates and inspires me. And also this question of legacy. And so when I find myself in moments where I'm feeling uncomfortable, I remind myself that this is so much bigger than me and I should be thinking about what it is that I'd be leaving behind. So at the Fed, I found myself um, creating another stream of work for myself outside of economic research and doing data analysis for policy and doing a lot around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's really led to things that weren't in place um, to start off. And some of those include the African-American employee resources groups across the Federal Reserve System now having meetings across the system with one another. And that was, something that I was inspired to organize um, after what happened around George Floyd and just wanting to get a sense of one, what are these institutions um, doing? Cause the Fed can tend to be siloed, um, but then also wanting to make sure that there was that connection that existed. And Clinton actually went on to become the chair for, for the African-American Employee Resources Group in DC and continue to have those meetings. So that was really cool to see. I also mentioned the fact that I realized the Fed didn't um, subscribe to the Review of Black Political Economy, which is the journal associated with the National Economic Association. And so that was something that um, the Fed then started to look into and it subscribed to it, which means that citations of black economists are now more likely because they, the economists of the Fed have access to, to that journal. So um, at this point, that's the question that guides me, like what um, legacy can I leave behind that's much bigger than any, any fear that I have in the moment? Um, and it may sound kind of cynical <laughs> for me to say this, but um, I, I think about this concept of death and like how it can come at any moment and our, our time here is not guaranteed. And that's when I do think about that actively, that really humbles me. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is definitely been magnified with again, the melee that was 2020 and the coronavirus pandemic. Sure. I think that's quite astute of you. And so I'm just curious, we, we touched upon your kind of career path and managing the Sadie Collective. And this is for those that are econ majors might seem like an kind of an unconventional sort of route to be um, making a splash in terms of the field of economics or these other sort of quantitative fields. And so um, what precipitated um, you to take this specific route uh, opposed to um, maybe the traditional IRA at the Fed, then I go into a PhD program and I do whatever is after the PhD program. What precipitated this sort of path for you? Yeah, lovely question. And that reminds me of how 
the content that we make for the Sadie Collective conferences is really inspired by the questions that we have as the organizers of it. So for instance, we, um, we had panels featuring economists in our 2020 conference who did not have PhDs. And so seeing people like Joelle Gamble and others who don't have PhDs who are making a splash in the economics profession um, was really inspiring and encouraging of the possible avenues that exist in the field. With that said, having a PhD can open so many avenues and doors and I have not completely canceled it out. Um, but I also recognize that I love being close to solving problems and seeing its immediate impact. And that's what led me to the MPP MBA route. So the MPP really speaks to the broader systemic questions that we are able to address with policy tools. And then the MBA speaks to implementation and also being in spaces like the private sector where you have access to money and funds to get that work done. And so the intersection of the two, I find really fascinating. Um, and I would describe that as public private partnerships. And it's a space that I really am interested in dabbling in. So that can look like philanthropy, that can look like working at think tanks and doing economic research. And I am constantly redefining my career path. And I would say at the moment, I'm interested in workforce development and how we ensure that there are people who are not left behind as the world of work continues to evolve. So we're seeing that automation is growing. And if there are groups of people who aren't able to have their skills developed so that they can be prepared for streams of work that would not disappear, then they'd be left behind and that would even further deepen inequality. So I'm really interested in exploring that space and the MPP MBA allows me to explore that. Um, and currently with the Sadie Collective, I've actually been able to take courses that have allowed us to refine our theory of change and to refine how we're able to um, think about the organization. And so I really appreciated being able to marry my interest with the Sadie Collective directly with my coursework. That's amazing. And so a couple more questions from our audience. Um, as a Black woman in economics, okay, um, what one piece of advice do you wish you would have been given kind of early on in your career or piece of advice that you were given um, maybe while pursuing your undergraduate degree? Kind of one thing that you wish you would have known or one piece of advice that sort of stands out? I wish I had access to the information and the people that the Sadie Collective puts in front of its members. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, we had like Dambisa Moyo, who is a development economist, come to speak to the collective. We've had um, people like Joelle Gamble, who's currently the special assistant to Biden on economic policy, come and speak to us. And overall, all of these different women show how you can use economic tools through different pathways. And having that exposure earlier on, I think, could have been really valuable for me. Um, I also think that it's not easily accessible or clear the fact that math and having that math background goes a long way. So mm -hmm. if you know that the PhD route is one that you're interested in, um, ensuring that you have those math components and that background um, is, is pretty important. And so with this other question, Brittany, that was asked about how did you know to pursue like an MPP MBA? Mm -hmm. I think it'd be great for you to share about your path and pursuing a PhD in economics. Oh, sure. Putting me on the spot. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to share. I feel like you've heard this story ad nauseum, but I actually entered Spelman. I was dead set on being an engineer. So I was in the dual degree engineering program, started out as a math um, major. And, um, and actually, as I was taking my introduction to engineering course, I realized this, I had this epiphany that I really wanted to use math to solve sort of um, social problems. And so it was a bit abstract for me at that phase, how I could achieve that 
as an engineer. And so I think this is just the beauty of um, a liberal arts education, right? So I had to <laughs> actually take economics and um, it definitely just opened my eyes wide to the ways in which you can use math to think about social problems. And as I was on that route, I first thought, okay, if I'm in economics, I definitely need to do finance, right? So I did all these finance internships and it just was not a good fit for me, right? So I realized that the way that I like to work is that I like to really sit down and wrestle with the question and really apply the most rigorous approach, which is when you're in corporate, not necessarily the opportunity that you have um, because of the, the turnaround of that work. Great training, great experience. I learned a lot about how to package and, and market myself and um, to deal with clients, but not the best fit for me in terms of what I, the, the nature of work that I wanted to do. And so I remember coming back after these multiple summers of <laughs> internships and investment banking and speaking with a professor in the economics department about careers. And she told me about the um, AEA summer training program. And I went on to do that and um, had a class with Derek Hamilton, which was amazing, right? And so <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> and so I knew this was definitely the path for me. And so basically, I, I worked with intention um, towards pursuing a uh, PhD. And um, what that looked like was a bit different than this traditional route of kind of being doing undergrad, getting this research experience, maybe as an RA or working under professor. I actually worked in, I worked in consulting um, for a bit, but I went on to get a master's abroad in my research area of interest and do some work, some applied work in that area with a medical school um, in Europe and a team of researchers working on this project to really help um, uh, improve the um, EU regulatory system for medical devices specifically. And then I came back and really um, leveraged that experience to uh, hone in on what I wanted to do research on as a, a, a PhD student. And that's actually where you find me today. So I feel like, although I had this sort of traditional uh, untraditional sort of trajectory, I was able to build myself up in ways that I think I may have um, crumbled had I not um, in a PhD program. So I just think that there are some really fundamental things that I got from having to be out in the real world, learn, get a better sense of how people receive me in spaces where um, they might not used to might not be used to seeing me and how to begin to advocate for my right to be in that space. And I think um, build my confidence um, in that. And I think that's been really critical. Although it's, the, the PhD program is definitely challenging, but I think having that fundamental experience and um, understanding of self is what actually gets me through the day to day with that process. So, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank but enough you. about me, enough about me, back to you. Uh, <laughs> no, you're incredible. Everyone needs to know about you, Brittany. <laughs> oh, thank you. Don't hype it. Don't hype it. I'm just the Lord's <laughs> vessel, right? Um, so uh, we have a question out there from Lauren, Lauren Taylor, and she's curious about your biggest setback um, in sort of pursuing this, this route, this professional route that you've had and how you've overcome challenges. Yes, so the lack of community at first um, in terms of just not um, not being aware of other Black women in the space, role models really matter. And so when Anna and I met and then like found ourselves going to the American Economic Association conference together, it really allowed us to start to have that sense of community within each other. So, so in that, um, just being open to those connections and, and networking and finding each other was really important. Um, and then being in my first predominantly white space ever, um, well, okay, I, I worked at like the Department of State and like all these other places, but as far as working full time in a predominantly white space, it was the Fed for me. And, um, and those first couple of months um, where I was just trying to find my way was pretty tough, but once I really held on to what my superpower was and just recognizing that 
I am capable. I'm competent. I can do it. <laughs> I'm competent. For those in the back. <laughs> Listen, those affirmations went a really long way. And mm -hmm. it, um, it allowed me to then be in my proper, like, okay, being properly reminded of who I was. Like, I went to this amazing institution, Howard University. I got a lot done there. And I've done so much outside of that space too and just being reminded of who I was. So I would say in overcoming that setback, Sadie Collective, Anna, um, role models and just speaking to people who were in the field and doing really interesting work. I think that was also just critical because the way black women study economics is unlike um, mainstream economics. And so hearing about the work of Valerie Wilson, who's at the Economic Policy Institute and leading um, PRE, which is about the study of race and ethnicity. And where did she go to school? Oh, did she go to Southern? Yeah, she went to Howard. Oh, <laughs> did she go to Howard? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna give you some shine, Howard. <laughs> He's amazing. I won't be surprised. I mean, just He's amazing. excellence. Um, and so, yeah, like uh, Dr. Valerie Wilson, um, Dr. Cook and seeing her work, I think it's really important to pay attention to the women who are in the field and doing really interesting and exciting work. Because if you pay attention to the other noise that's out there, it's going to point you away from economics because economics um, can be a very hostile environment. Like you see the data, you see the the conversations that are happening on econ Twitter and just more broadly, and it doesn't look great. But when you speak to these individual people and you see how their work is transforming lives in the field and perceptions and how, like Dr. Malvo shared during our conference is turning 10 syllable words into two syllable words. And she mm -hmm. talks about um, how when you do economic research, you should take that work to your church. You should make it accessible to the community. She's someone who um, is known as the people's economist because she would be on NBC and all of these different news outlets and just sharing economics in a way that is really accessible. So, so I found seeing those people to be incredibly critical to my journey. Um, and yeah, yeah. I also found it helpful to have a really great manager who um, was an ally for me and a sponsor and allowed it to be easier for me to navigate the bed. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that was also quite important. And for the Sadie Collective, we have quite a few allies who pushed our work. And that's why we give an annual Allyship of the Year Award so that those who are in the field and who are not Black women know what it looks like to be great allies. And we give this award and we cite specific examples of how they were helpful. And our hope is that that kind of helps to expand the imagination of what it looks like to support Black women in the field. Oh, that's amazing. And kind of on that front, um, there was a question out there about where you see the field evolving in the context of uh, Black women, um, mm -hmm. in particular, maybe the work that's done by the Sadie Collective. Um, kind of what is your sort of vision for the evolution, let's say, in the next maybe 10 years, 20 years, what, yes. what would you like to look like? Yes, so when it comes to the nonprofit sector, the nonprofit sector is about addressing market inefficiencies. And ideally these inefficiencies would not exist. And so ideally I would want the Sadie Collective to kind of disappear because like the problem solved. <laughs> but until then, we are here to stay and we are really interested in democratizing economics education. And so one of our priority areas is reaching more high school students. We've had students attend our conference in the past and then go into declaring an economics major. And so that's incredibly powerful because when we look at the number of black women who are studying economics on the college level, it's actually still pretty low, right? So when we're seeing four Black women graduating with PhDs in economics, 
annually, it's bad, right? Um, but we also need to have more people on the college level studying economics because even with a college degree in economics, that opens doors. So like Brittany was saying, she was able to explore the finance space and black women are underrepresented there. And economics is one of those liberal arts degrees, if not the only, that's like pretty lucrative. And so we want to see a shift in the number of high school students who are um, declaring economics majors, we'd like to see that shift and change. We're also looking at Black women globally. So there's a huge opportunity to be reaching more Black women throughout the diaspora, whether we're looking at Brazil, which has the most um, Africans outside of Africa, or across the African continent. So those are uh, connections and questions that we're looking at and exploring further. And the Gates Foundation, which is one of our recent donors and funders is really interested in helping us get there too. So, so we, we have a grand vision that is not limited to what you see now. And we're really just getting started. There's a lot of work to be done and black women deserve to be empowered wherever they are in the world. So we wanna ensure that they are empowered powerful positions of influence across the world. So that's what we're working towards. Oh, well, thank you, Fanta. This is just amazing. And so I think we're actually reaching the end of time um, for today's session, but I really, really have been inspired by this talk. And I just want to make one sort of correction. Um, Valerie Wilson actually went to Chapel Hill, I believe. Okay. Um, not Howard. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking of someone else. Um, okay. She did just, get mentored by Dr. Spriggs. So that, yes. okay, there is that you. Howard connection. That's, that's the Howard connection. <laughs> All roads lead back to Howard. HBCU love. You know. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and so um, I just have been so inspired by this talk today. And um, I hope our audience is equally as inspired. And um, I want to just give a, another big thank you to Fonta for joining us. And I want to remind the audience to please fill out the post-event survey so we can continue to improve these events for everyone. The key word for this survey is NSTMF unscripted. And if you complete the survey, you have a chance to win a pair of noise canceling headphones, which I think are invaluable in this day and age of working from home and maybe in spaces where there might be multiple people. So um, not only will we value your, your feedback, but you can also win, um, potentially win a really great item. And so we want to thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you, Fanta, to your words of wisdom. And we want to wish everyone a great night. For those of you on the West Coast where I am, um, have a great afternoon and thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.